Good evening, good evening, friends. Thank <laughs> you for being part of this <coughs> important session. We are very happy that today we are releasing an important publication, Powering Nature, Creating the Conditions to enable, Enabling Nature-Based Solutions. We know that we are in a really interesting time. We are in the first year of a decisive decade, a decade in which we are planning to address the two biggest challenges of the world, climate change and nature loss. And when we think about that intertwined crisis, nature-based solutions is becoming a really important tool that it is getting traction. So for today's session, and later I will introduce <coughs> our panelists, we will present some recommendations to continue enabling conditions to make nature-based solutions a strong reality. Having said that, let me give the floor to Marco Lambertini, DoubleDoubleDev International CEO, for an opening remark. Marco, you have the floor. Manuel, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us uh, so late uh, in the day. Uh, Manuel is right. This is um, a, a, an important report, but particularly is an important report on an important topic. And uh, let me just say, Manuel has already mentioned, we are in a critical, uh, critical junction because on one hand, uh, all the indicators of the health of the planet are going in the wrong direction, we know that. I don't need to remind you, you must have heard this 100 times during these few days of the Congress. But on the other hand, <coughs> we are also, uh, something else is happening, which I think is extremely exciting and has the potential to uh, transform what we have to transform, the relationship, our relationship with nature. In the last, I would say, several centuries and particularly in the last uh, several decades, what is known and as the great acceleration of unsustainable use of resources. We have, uh, on one hand, <coughs> disconnected for nature, from nature our uh, uh, production and consumption system, our economy where the economy has developed at the expenses of nature and uh, uh, creating all the problems we are facing today, including climate change. And, uh, and on the other hand also, we have disconnected ourselves culturally and, and billions of us have disconnected from nature in our lifestyles. It's time to change that. It's time to realize that uh, uh, that cannot be, uh, cannot continue, it's not sustainable. And this is the, the, the new dimension of our times. I really, I really believe so. And I, you know, I've been in conservation for a long time, in nature conservation for a long time. I, n I never seen um, climate, of course, but also nature higher in the political, in the corporate, and in the public agenda. It's actually amazing. And particularly, it's not just the fact that it's high in the agenda, it's how we begin to perceive nature is a true I said this several times in other panels, is a true cultural revolution, is a true shift from considering nature something beautiful, nice, uh, for which we have a moral duty to coexist with, to actually an essential element to our economy, our prosperity, our uh, 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 well-being, our health, our happiness, something that really underpins uh, our future. So that's truly a cultural revolution because this is uh, bringing us to realize that we can't take nature for granted any longer and we need to embrace a significant change in our behaviors and systems it's not tweaking the edges we are talking about a deep change and that's mm -hmm. the challenge but it's also the great opportunity so this report and i'll end over after this uh, short introduction to manuel and the panelists this report is important in two senses for me and has got two new elements perhaps. One is that he's talking about nature-based solutions, um, reminding us that actually nature, nature has been at the basis of solutions of so many things. Mm -hmm. We've been taking inspirations from nature in, in order to evolve our technology. Biomimicry is called. It's called uh, we, we've taken uh, uh, nature as an inspiration uh, to develop new pharmaceutical compounds that saved millions and millions of lives. Now it's time to take nature as an inspiration to address some of the key societal challenges that we're facing today. Obviously, nature-based solutions are known to be nature-based solutions to climate change, but actually 
there are nature-based solutions to water uh, scarcity, to food uh, insecurity, to poverty, malnutrition, uh, uh, and, and so on and so forth. All the big challenges our society is facing can be addressed with the help of nature. Um, but for that, we also need to embrace a very clear direction. Manuel is absolutely right. It's clear that nature and climate Biodiversity and climate are the two major challenges, climate change, biodiversity loss, challenges of our time, uh, because destabilizing that will destabilize everything else. But uh, uh, in order to address those two challenges properly, we also need to be clear on what is our global goal. On climate is clear, carbon neutrality, z uh, net zero emissions by 2050. On nature, that's what we're discussing in this Congress. We need a global goal for nature as powerful, as clear, as unifying as climate change. We in WWF and many others, in the pavilion for example, are supporting this goal of nature positive. More nature at the end of the decade than we have today. This is a disruptive goal, like the one for climate that has disrupted the energy sector, pushing electrification, pushing renewable energy, will be disrupting the other sector that are driving nature loss. Agriculture fishing, extractives, forestry, infrastructure. Imagine nature positive infrastructure. Amazing to mandate government and corporate and investors to do that. That will be a disruption in the sector. They will have to find ways to develop infrastructure but not losing nature. So that's my little introduction, but this is a great report. I invite you to, to read, uh, read it for sure, to engage in the follow-ups of course, which is about getting it to work. So Manuel, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Marco, for your introductory remarks. And, and how we will proceed? I will present briefly what the report contains, and after that I will leave to our great panelists to make some comments around how to <coughs> enable conditions to strengthen nature-based solutions as a key tool to address this intertwined crisis in between nature and climate. And let me start by saying something personal. As you probably know, some of you know, <coughs> I've been involved strongly in the climate debate. A debate in which we've been able to develop many, many good things. One of those, the Paris Agreement. And when people ask to me, how can you summarize the uh, strength of the Paris Agreement, I am used to saying, the Paris Agreement, it is a good one <coughs> because it has a clear threshold. Everybody knows it has been adopted by consensus that we cannot arise temperature in more than 1.5 by the end of the century. And that has been confirmed by science, mostly by the IPCC. Also, we know clearly what are those two main objectives. Decarbonization, that it is related to the concept of net zero, despite that still there are many contentious elements that we are discussing what is the role of nature in the net zero, what it should be the role of carbon markets, what does it mean, what is that mitigation hierarchy, but nobody is doubting about the concept and the objective to be net zero by the half of the century, but also to be resilient and to develop adaptation plans as a way to reverse what the poorest people and the ecosystems are mostly suffering. So those two objectives are key. And we have the NDCs as a way to implement that are our domestic climate plans. And we are pushing and encouraging our countries to raise ambition, to be more ambitious. This is the year of ambition when we think about climate. And we have some enablers, finance, technology transfer, capacity building, the role of the non-state actors, the role of science, among some others. And we used to ask some years ago, where is nature? W what is happening with nature that it is not getting the same traction? But fortunately, that has started to change. And that is good. And now we are in a time in which we can say, fortunately, that we are working to develop a clear vision for nature, the concept of nature positive, no? that it is mm. evolving. We are working in defining exactly what does it mean nation positive. And it is good because soon we will be able to say we have net zero nation positive as two 
main objective to move towards sustainable development, and that is good. But also we have some key objectives. Objective that it is related to how to protect nature, but how to change our production and consumption patterns. And that is why the importance of the targets. We do need still to continue thinking on how can we strengthen the MBSAPs as a mechanism that it should be equal as the NDCs, mm. politically as important as the NDCs. And for sure we should continue moving finance, more science, IPBs, it's strengthening their information, what it is good, and all of that it is creating more awareness, what it is fantastic. And in that scenario, so now we have climate <coughs> and nature becoming as strong as climate. What for me it is uh, filling me with a lot of optimism because that's good, that is the way that the world should move their action. And in that sense, nature based solution is becoming a key tool, not only to address the climate crisis, but to address and to reverse nature mm. loss. And that is why we have produced this report as a way to continue contributing to strengthen that tool. So let me start the next place by saying that we haven't printed physically the report. It's environmentally friendly. This is the only printing, uh, printed one and it is just to show it. So it is the single version. But if you want to access to the report, please use the QR that it is in the card that probably you have gotten in the front desk. It is a good report. <coughs> it has been produced by WWF people, but a multidisciplinary team and a multi-geographical team. What it is good, and it is based not only in the experience that we <coughs> have developed, but also in what it is our contribution to the process. That is the idea of the book. And let me start by saying why we have produced this report, why we are releasing this report. I've already mentioned the main idea. We are in a process in which we are start to facing the nature crisis. And to do that, we do need to have effective tools to address it in an effective way. But in our point of view, this report it is also important because we do need to secure quality. When we think about tools as nature-based solutions, quality it is a key element and credibility. So we do need to secure that the intervention of nature it is <coughs> enough sustainable that help us to address the societal challenge that we are planning to address. So it is about credibility, it is about quality, it is about how much this tool can help us to address those elements. But also it is important to consider that nature-based solution is getting political traction. That is good. Look, friends, nature-based solutions, it is something that started outside the formal walls. It is not mm. something that was or started in the formal process of any convention. It is something that evolved since the year 2000 and through IUCN, fortunately, it, it has gotten even more content, what it is good. But now, fortunately, in the climate debate in COP25, it was recognized as part of the Standing Committee on Finance, first time ever in which nature-based solution has been recognized formally by a COP on climate. And fortunately for COP26, it has been prioritized as a key element for the incoming COP. But we have the other side, the CBD, in which we are living in a weird situation. Used to be in the draft O.5, and it has been deleted from the draft one. And probably you are wondering why? Don't make any <coughs> sense to have the CBD declining, to have nation-based solution as a key element mm -hmm. to address their own objective. And I am sure that through negotiations, nation-based solutions will come back to the content of the GBF. And why? Because the CBD has a lot to say to nation-based solution. It is the authority that can frame through principles what it is a sustainable intervention on nature. 
So this political traction, it is important because by this political traction, we are securing what I've already mentioned, the quality of this tool. But also we are producing this because in some way we are finally agreeing in the concept. For us now it is clear and IUCN is helping a lot in giving that content. And I am used to saying that singing the concept through three main values. The main value it is that nation-based solutions it is to address a societal <coughs> challenge. That is a key one. The first one that we have to confirm, if your intervention on nature that you are developing, it is not to address a societal challenge, it is not nature-based solution. That is a key element. And the point it is how can we confirm how much we are addressing that societal challenge. And in that sense, the global standards are giving to us guidance by saying the societal challenge should be well documented. Your intervention should make the people able to follow and to track progress. Your intervention should be measurable against the societal challenge that you are planning to address. So all of what it is, the societal challenge, it is a key element. It could be climate change in the mitigation or, or adaptation side. It could be food security. It could be health. It could be water security. It could be uh, risk management or it could be biodiversity itself. So the point, it is that that is the way in which we can secure that we are addressing that societal challenge. But what is the second value? A sustainable intervention on nature. When you confirm that you are addressing the societal challenge, you can move to the second one. How sustainable your intervention to nature is. And that intervention should produce two main outputs, biodiversity net gain and ecosystem integrity. And what is the authority who could confirm that? The CBD. The CBD through principles <coughs> could secure that our intervention, it is producing a biodiversity net gain. That is why we are proposing that have? through principles that what? should happen. And that is the way in which I think that CBD can recover the idea of nature <laughs> solution to produce win-win relations. <coughs> and what is the third value? Social considerations and trade-off analysis plus co-benefits. So when you think in nature-based solutions, keep those three main ideas because that is the way in which we can produce the expected outcomes. But also because nature-based solutions, it is a key element, a key tool to mainstream nature in our domestic plans. We can use nature-based solutions through NDCs. We can use nature-based solutions to address our main source of emissions, for example. I am Peruvian. What is the main source of emissions in Peru? Deforestation and land use change. 63.5%. It is not energy. It is not transport. It is not the industry. It is deforestation and land use. And that is happening in most of the country that are located in tropical areas. So the point it is, if that is a reality, how many nature-based solutions could help in addressing that in an effective way, creating co-benefits. And that is something that we are discussing in our report. And we have organized the report in 10 chapters. And these 10 chapters are addressing different elements. For example, how much nature-based solutions could be useful to talk and to change food systems. When we know that food can really integrate many elements, agriculture, deforestation, can address also the important things of food waste and food loss, diets, among some others. So how useful it could be nature-based solutions in the food system. Also, we are addressing flood management. How can by nature-based solutions, we can revert what it is the current idea of having dams, of regulating flows, water flows, when what we do need it is to manage flows, to manage flood. So the second chapter, it is about that element. A third chapter, it is about coastal management. So the relation of nation-based solutions with oceans. Oceans that it is used to being the hidden sector 
also it is getting more traction. And by working in nature-based solutions, by coastal management, we can really give to ocean and to coastal management the relevance that we serve. Also, we are proposing some climate smart intervention. How much we can, by defining a climate consideration, a more effective and uh, uh, usefulness uh, of, of, of the tool of nature-based solutions to address societal challenge. Something important that I am sure that Hindu is going to address, it is how much we must work by respecting rights, by respecting traditional knowledge, and by working with indigenous peoples as a way to use their traditional knowledge to address those societal challenges through nature-based solutions. But also finance, it is a key element. W probably you have seen the graphics on how much money it is flowing for nature or mostly to nature-based solutions. Almost nothing. In the last year, fortunately, some countries have defined some targets to increase their financial flows to cover nature-based solutions initiative. But that is not enough. So the point it is, how can we focus better our actions to get more financial support to cover nature-based solutions? But it is not just about of that. Also, it is by defining nature and nature-based solutions as a tool that can move the business sector into a nation-positive world. We have business sector defining target for a net zero world. We do need to have business sector with clear targets to move it into nation-positive world. And in that, nation-based solutions, actions could be very useful. <coughs> and also, we are talking about national and regional policies. And finally, how can we align our actions in the international convention. Probably I am taking too much time. Let me move quickly into some elements that are key for this discussion. What are the structural barriers for strengthening nature-based solutions? There are many. We are recognizing first the insufficient recognition of rights. Secondly, the missing social incentives. We are not including the needed social incentive. In some cases, policy conflicts. So there are contradictory policies that are not allowing us to address the challenges through nature-based solutions. Limited governmental capacities, and unfortunately, in many cases, corruption. So that is something that we should have into consideration to overcome those barriers. Also, something that we know very well, we are undervaluing the natural capital. And in that sense, it is so important to continue working in developing a narrative that can link the nature with the economy. What the UK government has just published some months ago with the Das Gupta Review, it is a good first step. But there are many other things that we could work on. We have in climate the Global Commission on Climate and the Economy. Why we don't have the same for nature? A global commission that can develop a good narrative to link nature with the economy because to develop that narrative that gives the deserved value to nature it is something that it is going to take time but we do need to start quickly and also what we do need it is a poorly uh, what, what it is a barrier it is a poorly directed finance so we have identified policy levers planning elements that could address all those barriers also some economic enablers that could contribute and help mm. to make nation-based solutions a strong reality. So I won't take more time to describe the report. I do prefer to have you reading it and also to have your <coughs> feedback. I am sure that you are going to enjoy. It is a contribution of WWF to this process. It is amazing if you move your face to your left or to your right, everybody is talking about nation-based solutions. So let's make a nation-based solution a strong reality and a strong tool to address the different societal challenges. Let me finish by thanking the chief editors of this document, Stephen Cornelius from WWF UK and Vanessa Perez Sidera from WWF International. They put in their own hands the coordination within teams 
to make this report a strong reality. So thank you, thank you very much for being here. So now, because I am like master of ceremony, <laughs> presenter and moderator, let me move into, in, into the panel. Saving money. <laughs> so we have four panels. Let me start by apologizing Carlos Manuel Rodriguez. No, he confirmed, but unfortunately, he has already taken a train to go to Paris. As you know, Carlos Manuel is working in the EEF replenishment. So he has important, important uh, meetings to get money. We hope and we uh, wish him a lot of success in the replenishment because the GF it is a very important tool to support our biodiversity actions and action to reverse nature loss. So for today, we will have a very good set of panelists. Virtually first, I will introduce Gioti Matur Philippe, she is director of the UN CBD. Hi, how are you, Yoti? After that, we will have Hindu Humaru Ibrahim. She is the Sahel region representative of IPACC. And then Stuart McGuinness. He is the deputy director general uh, of IUCN. So uh, let me leave the floor to you, Yoti, for your reflections. Thank you so much. And um, thank you, Marco. And Manuel for inviting us, the CBD uh, Secretariat here. As you know, we are in the middle of our post-2020 discussions on developing a 30-year fr framework for all by 2050 and to achieve our vision of living in harmony with nature by 2050. So we're very, very thrilled that you invited us and um, have given us a lot of challenges also today. <laughs> Um, so just a brief update on our work. We uh, just concluded two weeks of um, the first <coughs> set of discussions on the first draft of the Global Biodiversity Framework, which was um, developed by our co-chairs of the process and the secretariat together. We had very robust discussions. And um, even though you say that nature-based solutions is not uh, in the in any target, um, you know that um, nature-based solutions and ecosystem-based approaches have been prominently discussed last in the last two weeks. And uh, regarding the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, and the focus of nature's contributions to people is reflected in a number of draft targets and in. Uh, a specific goal in the zero draft and the first draft. And in fact, everything that all your, um, uh, you know, all the headings that you listed, food, coastal management, climate smart interventions, finance, rights of people, indigenous people, traditional knowledge, they all feature in a target, even though we don't use the name nature-based solutions in the in um the in in the post 2020 global biodiversity framework however as we say nature-based solutions are, are often discussed in relation to climate change and we know that strong action needs to be taken to keep climate change well below two degrees and close to 1.5 uh, degrees uh, above pre-industrial levels and we need to prevent the climate impacts from overwhelming all actions um, that support biodiversity. So as you know, the IPBES report that came out in 2019, the global assessment, considered climate change as one of the drivers of biodiversity loss. Um, so the conservation and restoration of ecosystems can play a substantial role in the effort as illustrated by our global, envi our global biodiversity outlook, which came out last year, such nature-based solutions could provide about one-third of the total net emission reduction effort required to keep climate change close to 1.5 degrees. However, for us, with appropriate safeguards, they could also enhance a wide range of ecosystem services 
including water filtration, flood and coastal protection, soil health, and they also contribute to conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. For us, there are four very important caveats to the use of nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based approaches. Firstly, while they are an essential part of the solution, the climate problem cannot be solved without stringent reductions in the use of fossil fuels. Second, the distributional impacts must be considered and indigenous peoples and local communities, which you have already mentioned, must be fully involved in the development and implementation of ecosystem-based approaches. Third, while many ecosystem-based approaches have co-benefits for biodiversity, this is not always the case. And a very careful assessment of synergies, trade-offs and safeguards is required. For example, in particular, tree planting is not always appropriate, especially non-native species or monoculture plantations. Fourthly, climate change impacts can undermine ecosystems resilience and thus weaken the contribution of ecosystems to both mitigation and adaptation of climate change. So all of these four caveats must be taken into account when make, doing any work around uh, nature-based solutions. It is essential uh, to keep these in mind and only efforts that truly contribute to social objectives, which also you mentioned, uh, Manuel, in a just manner while protecting biodiversity are counted as truly true nature-based solutions. Clearly, ecosystems-based approaches and nature-based solutions also go beyond um, climate mitigation and adaptation. They are interconnected with other key issues such as sustainable agriculture, which you also mentioned, provision of clean air and water, green infrastructure, and urban green spaces. Our GBO5 also reported the transformations needed to be achieved in the production of goods and the services, especially food, also something you mentioned. This includes adopting agricultural methods and that meets the growing global demand while imposing fewer negative impacts on the environment and reducing the pressure to convert more land. It also means limiting the demand for increased food production by adopting healthier diets reducing food waste and addressing the consumption of other material goods and services affecting biodiversity. Deployment of green infrastructure and making space for nature within built landscapes to improve and uh, the health and quality of life for citizens also needs to be factored. Each area of action relies on potential changes and innovations implemented on a short time scale and involving a range of actors at all scales and across all sectors. Looking ahead, it will be critical for nature-based solutions to leverage broad action, recognizing the value of biodiversity and enhancing or restoring the functionality of ecosystems on which all of us, all aspects of human activity depend. I also want to end with um, a, a request to Marco um, because he, we, we have been talking about the single goal for nature or for biodiversity for a very long time, but we have to keep in mind um, that we, our convention has three objectives, not just conservation. We also have sustainable use and access and benefit sharing of, um, of genetic resources. So any. Um, any global or uh, one um, uh, goal must include uh, these, um, the three objectives of the convention uh, to be, and to be equally fair across all, uh, all, all um, the entire um, convention. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And thank you for providing us with an opportunity. Thank you very much, Yoti. Very, very good points. And it is good that you have reminded us the three main objectives of the convention. That is a key element when we think about biodiversity because it is for sure conservation, but also sustainable management and, and access and benefit sharing 
are two, two key elements. But also I would like to, 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 to raise the importance of your caveats. You know. For sure, when we think about nature-based solutions, it is not a way to divest what it must be for the world a key priority, that it is a systemic transformation of the energy system. That is key, and to eliminate subsidies to fossil fuels, and, and to phase out gradually from all the different fossil fuels, it is some element that we should have into consideration. The fully involved and engaged of indigenous peoples and the protection of the rights and their traditional knowledge. Safeguard and trade-off analysis. That is a key element that I am sure that Stuart in mm -hmm. some way by talking about the global standard probably he could address. And resilient ecosystem. So thank you, Yoti. I hope that you can stay for some more time for a second very short round after the rest of the panelists. So, Hindu, Jyoti has mentioned the importance of working with indigenous people. And, and, and I know that when we think about nature-based solutions for many people immediately come back the idea of red plus, carbon market, and, and the resistance, you know, many people to say, we cannot make a market what it is culture. You know? so, so how can we, by working with indigenous people, we can make nature-based solutions a strong instrument to address all those societal challenges. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Manuel, and thank you, Marco, for uh, uh, really this event, these invitations. And hi, everyone. It's so, so great to see your faces mm -hmm. and being in person. This is also one of the nature-based solutions. We need the social life in order to really give us energy to fight and protect the nature. So. What is nature-based solution for indigenous peoples? For indigenous peoples, it is our way of life. It is the way of life for centuries and centuries. Maybe people just talk, come with the name and call it a nature-based solutions, but for us, we're living it since it's centuries. Don't take me wrong. Nature-based solution in my community is a bullshit. <coughs> Why I say I say bullshit? I mean. Let me explain. It is a bullshit because when you own a cattle, you are a pastoralist. You move from one place to another one. So you leave your cattle sheet to fertile the land in a natural way. And that helps <laughs> to regenerate the nature. So the bullshit is a solution. <laughs> it's a nature-based solution. <laughs> That's how we have to take it. And indigenous people around all the world, they know a different knowledge to divest the ecosystem from the oceans. Because when we talk about the nature based solution, it is not only around the forest or around the uh, land. It is also around the oceans, where the Pacific peoples know where are the mangroves, where are the coral reefs that can help to divest the ecosystem inside the sea in order to give them the food. So that's also part of our traditional knowledge. I really like the report, how it is a structure. But one thing maybe need to get improved. It is to do not put separate indigenous peoples and indigenous peoples rights. It is connect indigenous cross. peoples and rights as cross cutting issue. We are not in a single box. That is what used to happen in all the environmental life. And as you all see, I will keep repeating that in this event. At the opening ceremony, how many people were in the stage? Of course, the presidents, the actors, and uh, 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 the, the, the farmers that managing the funding. And what they have in common, all of them mentioning indigenous peoples and indigenous peoples in the protection of the nature. But what they forget about it, indigenous peoples have a mouth, they can talk, they are there, they don't need a babysitting. They can talk for themselves. So why people keeping talking about us without putting us in the place that we want? They all agree that we need indigenous peoples into the decision-making tables. Thank you, you made it, because I'm in the tables, and I also think my other colleagues, indigenous peoples, can be in the tables in your discussions and talk for ourselves. But it is not the case where they are taking the right decisions. Mm. So that needs to change. If you can make it as cross-cutting in this report, and you can ask them 
we can talk for ourselves so that can help the nature-based solutions to move forward. Second thing is, you talk about our knowledge. Why it is so easy to talk our, about our knowledge and not about our rights? Our knowledge are connected to our rights. So don't choose on someone. <laughs> Take it at all. So you cannot just to say, I take one finger and I, ca I cannot take the others. All the fingers work together. Otherwise, if you don't have one, you miss, there is something missing in your body. So us, knowledge, rights work together. Third thing is, you talk about the finance. And I really like also the point you say, how much finance is going to the nature-based solutions to the climate? from the climate to biodiversity. It's like one person. And Nature Based Solution, Marco, you said it is in all the agenda, luckily. But is it really a talk or is it a reality? Mm -hmm. So there is need of shifting the finance to fund the Nature Based Solutions. And when I say they fund the Nature Based Solutions, they must fund the indigenous lead solutions. Mm -hmm. They all recognize we have our own technology. We can predict the weather, first case. We can restore the forest. We can protect the mangroves. We can restore the ecosystem with our bull bullshit. So why not to give us this money to develop more what is the called the nature-based solutions? Why not to give more the funding for the organizations who are doing the right things rather than just to choosing biodiversity here, climate here, and let us put 1%. So this is really so important. And if you can highlight in, in the report also, those funding need to come directly to the implementation on the ground. We cannot agree anymore. Those countries use the money to go to the international level, to organize a meeting, say, we committed to give. Commitment will never end up something. As I said, I do not believe on love. I believe on proof of love. So the proof of love is the cash in the tables, not the commitment in the money. So that can help all of us to stand up and go with the action. And this is my final point. Go to the, with the action because you say we are in the urgent time. How many years we have? 10 years. We in Chad, in my community, we already have plus 1.5 degree. The Paris Agreement's objective is already reached. The IPCC report said we don't have one century. By the next 10 years, in my communities, we are going to have plus 3 degree. Already 48 to 50 degree we have during the summer. Plus 3 degree is going to be 6. So food insecurity, migration, conflict between communities, and every single problem going to link with each other. So that's why we don't have the 10 years. We got the report, accept the report, <coughs> don't go to the study, because if you wanted to do any study, a PhD is going to take 10 years. We don't have time for that. So go with the ready study, indigenous peoples led solutions, trust us, invest on indigenous peoples, and you can get the right solution to restore biodiversity, to reduce climate impact, and to make the nature-based solutions a reality for everyone, not only, only for indigenous peoples. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Hindu. This phrase, funding to implement on the ground, it is a key one. A and it is true. Many intermediaries for that money and not money for to yeah. implement on the ground. And, and that is also happening domestically. Sometimes because of the public regulations for public money, there are no conditions to move money to develop nation-based solutions <coughs> with and for the people. I, 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 I saw in Peru a nice initiative to promote traditional uh, ancestral technology for irrigation, Waruwaru, Samumas, all those names, and without the support of the Minister of Finance because there are no that conditions. So when mm -hmm. we think about enabling conditions, it is also about those conditions. 
to make possible to move the money to the ground, to implement on the ground to the people and with the people. That, that, that is a key element. And also this connection in between, and that is key, knowledge and rights. Mm -hmm. This the same coin. It is exactly the same. We cannot separate both. So now let's move with Stuart. Stuart, you are, and I really appreciate what IUCN is doing and is working in <coughs> making nature-based solutions and a strong reality. So you move from the concept, then to the global standard. Also, you are testing, no, in some way, how well the standard is working, and probably you have some future plans. Could you share with us w what IUCN is expecting? It could be the next step for nature-based solution. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Manuel, and thanks, uh, Marco, for for inviting me here. Um, I'd like to just say congratulations. I uh, I sat outside and I, I read the uh, the summary. It's it's great. It really is. It's very. I think there's a couple of things that are important. It shows. Uh, it comes back to a point you made, Marco. It's th this is about this is about disruption. It's not about a few little projects here or there or whatnot. It's actually it's about disruption of a system. And I really like this point of actually getting us back. Uh, what did you say? Reversing that disconnection we have with nature. We have, I mean, for centuries there has been a connection with nature. Hindu and, 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 and other colleagues in the in, in indigenous peoples, members of IUCN can tell us uh, strongly about that. And yet we've lost that. And, and I, think th I, I think actually one of the things that I would do, say, do think is that since we've been able to formulate and frame nature-based solutions uh, 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 from this perspective of addressing societal challenges, it really has given us a boost to be able to represent biodiversity to a range of stakeholders who don't wake up in the morning thinking about biodiversity, but now realize mm. that this is important actually to be able to meet broader societal goals. So there's a couple of there's a couple of comments I would I'd like to make. There's many many comments I could do on this uh, on this on this report, but there's a couple I just wanted to focus down on uh, four five maybe if I get time. Uh, you can stop me if I if I slip into Irish mode and talk too much. I think the first one is a uh, the first one and it comes back to uh, the, the, what you mentioned on the on the on the standard. I do think it is important actually to have a framework, to have metrics, to be able to understand what we're doing, to be able to capture some of the learning. Um, we have, I think some, uh, and I'll just give you a couple of examples of where the, I think the standard is useful. The standard requires in criterion three, it requires biodiversity net gain. Not biodiversity neutral, not nature neutral, it, it, there has to be an increase in the integrity of biodiversity for something to qualify as a nature-based solution. Also, there is a, while, the, while we recognize that nature-based solutions um, I, I can apply to many situations, SDG and whatnot, there is only one international uh, agreement or one international uh, um, uh, um, text that we refer to, and that's the United Nations uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People absolutely fundamentally important and, and I, maybe I can just on, on that point I, I just like to segue into why I think stakeholders and this issue that you highlighted stakeholders is so important because I, what Re Hindu said really resonates very strongly with me in fact if I if I, uh, if I if I was in your shoes I would be getting a little bit annoyed everybody indigenous people indigenous people indigenous people that's not enough. It's not enough to invoke indigenous people. In fact, I would now say it's not enough just to say recognition. It's not enough just to say safeguards. And I really like your point. It's now about enabling the agency of indigenous people on their terms as equal partners to drive this forward. And so I really, and I, I, so I, I just, I just want to amplify what you say because I think I think that's important. And the I, and the and your colleagues in this union, in IUCN, yeah, those of you who are IUCN members, your colleagues in the, in the indigenous peoples category came out this week with a global indigenous agenda and I would really recommend that everybody looks at it because it is powerful and it talks about this issue of moving forward just from safeguards into agency. Right? So, so I, um, I, I also think the um, I think uh, just to come back uh, on, uh, to, the, to the issue then of metrics, I think metrics are important. One of the things we want to do now with the standard is start to maybe look, we've, there's a lot of demand now to sort of say, 
can, how do you actually assure this? So we are now going to start to work through a process of saying, with I uh, say not in competition with certification uh, uh, initiatives like FSC or what or fair trade. In fact, we're discussing with them, but can we create an MBS module? that other certification systems can actually use to actually reinforce this and to reinforce that nature positive element. Mm -hmm. Also to identify, uh, make sure that there is that issue of seriously addressing stakeholder and stakeholder rights, community involvement, indigenous right. people's involvement. So that's, that's one piece of work we're, we're working on. A, a couple of other things then just to come on the report. One thing I really liked and I think it's absolutely fundamental. I was actually just in, a, in an event on, on landscape restoration, which is one type of a nature-based solution, um, is this issue of coherency and coherency of government. We've got, oh, yeah. this is, uh, th I think in the old days, this used to be called joined up government. And if we're actually dealing with this issue of how do we start to address issues of perverse subsidies, well, one thing is to actually start to get ministries aligned around similar targets, getting them to work across each other, not uh, not work. And we've got good. The other thing is we've got some good examples of that. I really, I really do think that this is an opportunity now for us to start to, instead of having these tensions, come one's Ministry of Agriculture and Ministry of Environment, starting to actually see right. How do they actually work together? How do you set in place broader national goals around which you then can build up a joined up program of government? Uh, uh, one word on finance. I, there's a lot of word, uh, a lot of, uh, there's sort of, a, you know, climate change is great. They've got loads of money going in and we're still poor in biodiversity. The issue is actually, we still haven't lived up to our commitments on climate change. Yep. I think in total, there's about 67 billion that has gone into climate change. The promise was 100 billion a year as a starter. So we're still short there. But then we sort of start to wonder, well, what, what about uh, but then? How, how do we actually, where do we see the money for biodiversity? I think actually what we need to start to think about is a coherency of finance. We need to start to see that, that finance needs to be addressing livelihoods and climate change and biodiversity. This is the opportunity. Yoti just said a third of the solution of climate change can be found in nature. So it's not a competition between the two. It's mm. actually a sensible and clever deployment that deals with the livelihoods, that deals with, uh, with, uh, with investing in nature and nature positive action and yeah. of course addressing adaptation and mitigation uh, uh, um, uh, objectives. The um, the final the final point maybe I just have I, have I got time I want to make one, one more minutes, yes. one more point and I think it's 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 the it's the issue of we talked about finance I think we've also got to talk oh sorry one more thing on finance before I go when we talk of finance and this links back to the issues of inclusion and agency I think we've got, really got to start to think about inclusive finance. It's, and I want to re 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 echo yeah, Hindu's yeah, point sure. again. It's where does, w w how does the money flow? Does it get mediated through so many channels that communities on the ground get 10 centimes for every dollar? That's not going to be an incentive and yet it's going to be the communities on the ground to, to actually work. So I think there actually is, we need to find ways of actually, m of being able to get finance and financial flows. It's not good enough just to say we need more finance, we also need inclusive finance. Yeah. And I would say from two perspectives, one thing I'm very happy with, IUCN is working with the GF and CI, where we, we will now work on an inclusive finance initiative, which aims actually getting resources directly to okay. uh, uh, indigenous peoples and communities. And obviously, Hindu, you, you, you're aware of that. But the other thing is as well, I think we also, sh we shouldn't just think about this of grant money. I think we actually should start to think about loans as well. Mm. Why are loans only for the large corporates? <coughs> it's been 20 years, I think, Emmanuel, since your, uh, your fellow countryman, Hernando de Soto, wrote The Mystery of Capital. And I always wished someone would have write an equivalent. That was about urban situation and the urban poor and the barriers to action for, for actually uh, allowing so. urban poor people to invest. But I always wish someone would do the same for the rural situation. Mm. There is, if you look at the, the barriers to actually stop 
small scale farmers actually access capital so that they can invest in their own land, invest in nature based solutions. We need, this is, I was actually, I was having a, a discussion with KFW and uh, the Bessos Foundation and uh, a couple of other colleagues, the, the, the UK high level champion today. And I said, we need, this, can, this is a fixable problem to actually start to get opportunities that, uh, that, that uh, small farmers can actually go and take investments that they just don't need to rely on grants because they, it's not, public money is not enough. They need to be able to access and access uh, loans as well. And I do think this is a fixable problem uh, that we need to address. Very final thing on, on economics. I, I think one thing we really need to look at is the situation now post-COVID. Set many countries now, we are going to ask countries to implement their NDCs, to implement new targets coming from CBD, and they have all taken on additional public debt yeah. to deal with COVID. That's and cool. I think this is one thing we really need to That's seriously cool. look at now. How, how can you ask a country to do that when they're actually, they're paying out more, when their debt repayments are going higher? So I think we need to have a new generation Absolutely. of, I'm not going to call it debt for nature because as you know there was, there was a, I think quite a valid critique of debt for nature was that it was a, the conditionality was quite northern driven. But I think we need to have a new way of actually looking at debt restructuring and debt management that actually is based on help helping countries then enable, enable them to meet their NDC targets, That's meet right. their new targets under the CBD. Yeah. Because otherwise, how, can we, do, how yeah. can we ask that to be delivered when I say countries have just increased their That's debt right. burden because of COVID? Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Stuart. Look, friends, we are running, unfortunately, out of time. So yeah. we won't be able to take too much more time. But let's do this. We are less than two months ahead of COP26. So it's coming soon. It's November. And then the CBD COP15 in, in Kunming. A and then the summit, Stockholm Plus 50, next year in June 2022. So what should we prioritize to make nation-based solutions a more strong reality for the next two months? What it should be mm. our most immediate uh, steps that you think we should adopt as a way to continue moving this agenda forward? I don't want to point in anybody, but if somebody wants, do you want to start a uh, Ah, Hindu. I have one. Yeah. If all of you can work, make the financial system to commit at least for one billion dollars for indigenous people's direct access to the nature-based solutions. Very easy. There are a lot of money outside. We are selling a lot of billions and billions and billions. And we hear it from COVID and from everyone. To Just to comment, to to when we go to the COP26, and there is commitment of one billion dollars direct access funding for indigenous peoples. By the coming, it will be the implementation from the one billion dollars. I hope that I get all your agreement. You can work on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before of giving to Jyoti, no, no. excuse, uh, your your excuse, Marco. You, I you. know that you have. I'm sorry, I have to go. Yes, the, the next really meeting. No, no problem. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you so okay. much, Jody, Thank you very much. Okay, Jody, you, you want thanks to. Thanks a lot. You want to be the next? Yes, sure. One of the things that I think we could do over the next two months and um, by the way our COP actually starts on October 11th in Kunming but it's a split COP um, but I think one of the things we can do is raise awareness I'm, I I would wish I could be as ambitious as Hindu and I hope that that's possible uh, but uh, I think we need to raise awareness of the whole totality of what nature-based solutions means and one of the things that we need to get uh, into the, uh, I think, into the narrative and into the uh, uh, international governments to understand that uh, climate change and biodiversity solutions have to work together. Otherwise, we are going to be, I think, in the same spot we are today in 10 years because they both have to work together and uh, nature-based solutions, ecosystems-based approaches are probably a way where we can move forward. 
So I think that is something we should be able to do in the next two months. And especially as Glasgow is a nature cop. So it's, um, you know, uh, our outcomes were supposed to go to Glasgow, but now we'll have to do it in another way around. Thank you. Thank you, Yoti. And, and, and let, me, let me complement with something that the CBD Secretariat it is strongly working on. The, the, the CBD Secretariat it is pushing to strengthen the non-state actors agenda for nature. What it is good, what it is fantastic, because we know how useful it has been for the climate uh, objective to have the business, to have civil society, to have the, to have all different actors working together with parties, with countries in developing collective actions towards achieving a collective vision. So the CBD Secretariat it is working the same for nature. And I think that could be also a room and a place in which we can discuss nature-based solutions as a key topic. So thank you, Giotti. And finally, Stuart, mm. how much money? <laughs> uh, well, I must admit, I would have gravitated. Oh, sorry, I'm, I would have gravitated to, 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 to say finance as well. And actually, I don't think a billion. I mean, I'm sorry. We're supposed to be generating a hundred, a hundred billion a year for climate. So I don't think a, a billion, a, a billion for a, f a billion dollar fund for indigenous peoples is Easy. that uh, ambitious. Um, but I, I, I think actually over the next couple of months, I, I think one thing we all could do is we can start to challenge this narrative that we've got livelihoods here, climate here, biodiversity here. We, I think we can say, sorry, we don't talk that anymore. We talk nature positive. We bring this together. You cannot solve these issues. And I, and I don't think this is just going to be a couple of quirky people, you, Manuel, and Hindu, myself, you, you folks. I don't think, I, I have heard this actually, I've heard this actually all through this, uh, this conference as we've brought in mainstream speakers. I thought Christine Lagarde's this, uh, presentation was fantastic. Mm -hmm. We need to start saying about, th there has to be a coherence in how we solve this. This is Mark's point about this reconnecting with nature. We don't do, I'm sorry, we don't do climate over here and nature over here. We do nature positive driven through nature based solutions. I think we need to start to drive that. I think we have got real, I think there, this can actually get real traction with decision makers. And then, I, uh, and then when you say, well, what does that mean? Then let's start to get finance to work in this particular way. We don't need to see finance separated. We need to see finance that can actually be bundled to deal with livelihoods, deal with uh, climate and deal with biodiversity. Thank you very much, Stuart. And that is a, a really great idea. When we think about finance, mm. we can identify like three phases of the climate. We started by thinking on money, on mm. funds, no? Then we have moved finance into transparency and disclosure, yeah. what it is good. But the new phase must be alignment, yeah. no? Alignment of portfolios. And this idea of livelihood, climate and biodiversity, it is a key one yeah. to produce that alignment. Yeah. So thank you, Hindu, thank you, Giotti, thank you, Stuart, and thank you to you all for being part of this uh, session to celebrate the, the publication of this report. And please, scan your Q QR, o uh, QR code, read it, give your feedback, contribute, criticize if you wish, being open, and I hope that with this we are contributing to so important tool as nature-based solution. So thank you to you all, and thank you to all the people who were looking at us by streaming. See you. And thank you for moderating. No, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much.